You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. And welcome back. You are listening to The Social Workers live radio talk show here at WCDB Albany. I'm your co-host, Eric Hardiman, and I'm here with Alyssa Lotmore, my co-host. Hi, Eric. And today we have a special guest with us. I'm going to introduce John Forsyth. Dr. John Forsyth is an internationally recognized author, speaker, and trainer in the use of acceptance and commitment therapy, also known as ACT, and practices that cultivate mindfulness, loving kindness, and compassion passion. For over 20 years, his work has focused on developing ACT and mindfulness practices to alleviate human suffering. His personal journey and experience, balanced with practical insights grounded in scientific evidence, offers hope to those wishing to find a path out of suffering and into wholeness. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Forsyth is the author of several books. He's a professor of psychology here at UAlbany. He is the director of the Anxiety Disorders Research Program here at the university and does lots of other things, wears lots of other hats as well. So, John, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me, Eric. So uh, it's, we'll start off going, jumping right into um, acceptance and commitment therapy. So with all that's occurring in society today, there is an increase uh, in, uh, in the awareness of human suffering and your research around the practices of acceptance and mindfulness. Um, so you have an upcoming workshop that will focus on acceptance and commitment therapy, also known as ACT. What is uh, psychological and emotional suffering? What does that mean? Uh, what's the basis for ACT? Okay. Um, well, one of the interesting pieces, I think, you know, when you look at the human condition, that there's no escaping this simple truth that all of us will confront obstacles, problems, and pain. You know, there's just as a human being, there's no way to go forward without facing the difficulty that life offers. But a big piece uh, of the suffering comes into play into how do we navigate that, right? And so... Uh, and you know yourself, there are many people throughout the world who experience significant obstacles, problems, and pain, and they find a way forward. And we might wonder what little secret do they have. And it's actually uh, fairly simple, but it's hard for us to do, which is to uh, let go of our tendency to literally be at war with those obstacles, problems, and pain. Not just the pain of life from outside, from without our skin, but the pain inside. The things that bubble up that our mind gives us, what our body does, our emotions, our memories. And so the suffering is different. The suffering is you have the pain of life and on top of that, we're literally in a tug of war, a battle to not think what we think, to not feel what we feel, to not remember what we remember. And even the science shows that that just ties us up and all that energy poured into that is energy away from their life out there. You know, the things that we want to do, the things we want to be about, the things that we care about in our heart. So the suffering is, it's almost like pouring f gasoline on top of the natural pain. Right? And it pulls us out of our lives, which is painful itself, you know, life that's unlived. And on top of that, we still have the pain and we have our struggles with it. And then the mind rushing in and judging us, you know, you're not good enough. You know, why can't you just pull it together? Why can't you just be happy? And that hurts. Yeah. So, Do you find yeah. that there is an increase? I mean, you've been doing this for a while. Do you mm. find that it's been increasing over the years? I mean, just turning on the news, there's so much that we see and hear. And, you know, even if for young I children growing up, it's constantly this ability. This, they're always seeing something on the news or something that's happening, something that's scary, something that's causing suffering. Do you find that it's increased over the years that people that's um, psychological and emotional suffering and people trying to overcome it, the need for something like this? Well, I think, you know, it depends where you look, but in our culture, you know, that, I mean, I use this word sometimes, we, we live in a culture of feel-goodism, hmm. where the idea is basically that uh, pain is not okay, pain is a problem, so if you naturally experience it, because you will, if you're a living, breathing human being and you step outside your door, you're going to experience that pain, and our society says it's a problem, like other problems, and you need to do something to solve it, mm -hmm. right? And so we are 
kind of from a very young age taught that it's not okay to think what you think and feel what you feel even when it's hurtful and our culture supports the idea that pain is not a teacher maybe it's there to alert you to what's wise maybe the reason you feel so strongly whether it's anxiety or depression is because you care you care about something enough to feel strongly about it. Hmm. But our society doesn't give us that message. Instead, it's like, no, you've got that. That's a problem. And then you need to do something about it. So that just supports the whole agenda of struggle and control. So there are lots of ways, unhealthy ways, to not think, to not feel, to not remember. And that just, again, feeds that system. right? So in, in terms of increasing over time, I'd say... Yeah, I mean, our culture, that message is so firmly entrenched that it's hard to spot unless we step back and develop a perspective to see it. And now we're all plugged into our devices, which is so unusual. If you look at, you know, your parents, grandparents, generations, you know, you had to you know, speak to somebody, you had to go use the landline. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to see the news, you had to go sit in front of a television. But now we're plugged in and we're connected to pain anywhere in the world that other people are experiencing anytime, anywhere. With more images and more, just more footage, more things that oh, it's, it's, graphically, it's like you're there kind right. of sometimes because you have, you know, people recording things on cell phones and you're seeing actual events occurring, which can be cause some, tr you know, I don't know if it's tr the same type of trauma, but it can definitely cause individuals to have a reaction that they wouldn't have had if they maybe just read it or heard about it from somebody when you're actually seeing these these images. Right, like our early ancestors, you know, they worried about lions, tigers, and bears when they confronted them, but you've got one in your pocket and mm -hmm. it conjures up this, you know, culture of fear, right, which, you know, again, the mind gets involved. What if it's going to be me? This is terrible. And so now, you know, you've got these moments where you're trying to engage your life and go forward and then you've got these distractions in your pocket. You've got the culture saying it's not okay when you go forward and feel something that's painful. That's a problem. And then you've got to fix it. And there are, you know, medications to self-help books to just not doing certain things to distraction. You know, the, the list of possible strategies, including psychotherapy, I would say, could yeah. be another part of that agenda. Fix my pain and then I'll be happy. You know, so it's, it sets up this, this interesting dichotomy, you know, where we're, we can't be who we are. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, and so inside of that even is a darker message, I think, is that, uh, you know, if you step back and look at us as sort of historical creatures, you know, you think of yourself as sort of a vessel. And I like to use this metaphor when I teach and when I train people and even work with people one-on-one -on -one or coaching. Um, we all come into the world pretty much the same way. You can think of it as like we come in the world and we're this empty vessel and there are two eyes looking out on the world. But very quickly, we start to collect experiences in that vessel. Some are sweet, some are sour, some are bitter. And we'll continue to do so as long as we're alive. Right? So the things that go in, we know this from neuroscience too, is that modern neuroscience teaches us that the nervous system is additive, not subtractive. So what goes in stays in short of brain insult and injury. So you've got these experiences being poured in. Many are not of our own choosing. They just happen. Like anxiety yeah. happens. It's not a choice. Nobody chooses anxiety. Nobody chooses depression. It happens, but it's in the vessel. So now we're collecting these things and we're collecting and we're collecting and then we lose track of like who was there before the experience. Interesting. Right? The, the you that was there before the trauma. There was a you there before the depression. There was a you there before the job loss. There was a you there, the vessel. Mm -hmm. And so we get in, instead we get inside the vessel, we're like trying to rearrange the pieces. Like I want to throw out the dark ones and keep the brighter ones and I want to cover up the other ones and not think about these. And many people are literally at war with their vessel. So they take that vessel and they hold it at arm's length away from themselves. They try to throw it out. And we know suicide is probably the most tragic way to throw out yeah. <laughs> your experiences. And so what we teach instead and this is, I think, a really important point and something your listeners can take away from this is the question is, with all those experiences you hold in your vessel, the good, the bad, the ugly, how do you hold that vessel? Do you hold it um, in a way that's like distant and you know, literally like you're at war and struggling with this stuff? Or do you hold it close to your heart in a kind and gentle way, recognizing that you are not the things in there? They, they're part of you, but they're not you. There's a you that can notice all that. 
There was a you before the things that were in the vessel. And that is, can be a very powerful and liberating shift because now we're talking about how do you cultivate a kinder, gentler relationship with everything that you carry and learn to carry that forward into a life that you want to live. So is that the basis for the um, acceptance and commitment therapy? Is that when we're, when somebody's when you, we hear that when we hear actor, is that what the basis is for it, or can you explain a little bit? Yeah, and, and maybe how it came about a little bit too. I'm curious about the history and how you got involved with this and started developing it. Yeah, well, uh, act. It's kind of interesting. It, it came out of probably some will be surprised at sort of the radical behavioral wing of behavioral psychology, you know, and um, it came about, um, you know, my exposure to it was a time when I was in graduate school and I was being trained in cognitive behavior therapy and the idea there is, you know, that people have catastrophic thoughts and they have excessive emotions and uh, inappropriate, uh, you know, affect and, and whatnot and you have to go in there and change what people think and feel and teach them to cope differently with the stuff and then they'll be happy and they can live their life. And ACT was basically saying, no, 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 we're, we're, what's really important to human beings is, uh, you know, a sense of purpose and meaning and values and doing what you care about and how do you go forward when you have a mind that's constantly at work judging and evaluating and that's, that's basically what minds evolved for is to help us not become lunch, you know, to be able to, <laughs> to you know, to, to alert us to problems and to help us solve problems. And it really evolved as a tool, just like a hammer or a screwdriver. You've got the mind evolved as a tool, but we don't think of it that way. So we come to think of the mind as us instead of are our thoughts useful to us? Is this a helpful thought? If I listen to what my mind is telling me right now, you know, kind of conjuring up from my vessel, is that going to take me forward into the life I want or further away? So ACT intrigued me because I, I thought it was talking about issues that are central to the human condition and what it means to be a, a healthy human being and what psychological health is. And ACT was saying it's not the absence of pain. that It's the, the life is saying... How do we move forward with right. those inevitable problems and pains? So I really felt that that resonated more with me. You know, I tried the old CBT strategies of like, <laughs> you know, monitoring my thinking, challenging dysfunctional thoughts and unrealistic thoughts because I've got my stuff too in my vessel. And I found that it worked in the short term, but in the long term it was so effortful to constantly be getting in the mix and trying to change what I'm thinking. And inside of that effort is a darker message that it's not okay to have the things that I have in my vessel, because we're historical. And underneath that is an even darker message still, which it's not okay to be me. Yeah. It's not okay for me to have had the things that I have, which are what's bubbling up right now. So ACT turned that all on its head. It's basically like what we need to do is learn to get some perspective and accept what we um, cannot change, which even the science shows is we have very limited control of what we think and what we feel at any one time. Like I use a simple example, like twinkle, twinkle, little. Yeah. And I know what all you are thinking here and what your, reader, your listeners are probably you know, thinking the word star, mm -hmm. you know, and I could ask you like, don't think it, here it comes, twinkle, twinkle, little, yeah. <laughs> try really hard, you know, and here we're talking about star, we're talking about that in this like comfortable setting, you know, doing this radio show. So how are we going to do that when the words are more painful? Like, don't think about your shame, don't think about your guilt, don't think about their loss, don't think about the possibility of embarrassing yourself or losing something um, or how are we going to do it there if we can't even do it with the word star so that's like our yeah. history bubbling up so acceptance is to learn <clears throat> really um, to open up to our experience it doesn't mean we like it right we're not asking people to like sure you know feeling anxious or having memories that were painful resurface bubble up again but is to be open to it in the service of something more important than the fear, more important than the, than the old pain that we carry. Uh, and so that's where the values part comes in. So 
acceptance, you know, life is asking us to be flexible in a sense to, to like an athlete, to stretch and be limber. And when pain shows up in our vessels and we carry that, we tend to harden and shut down and we get into struggle mode. So we're asking people to not change what you think. You're not asking you to subtract the things that you carry and the things that are hurtful, but to change your relationship with this. And so the acceptance, learning to truly accept what you cannot change, which is just the presence of you know, the stars, twinkle, twinkle, little, you know, those kinds of things that pop up. To open up to it, to be kinder to yourself, to be, which is, I think, more loving when you drop the rope and you lay down your arms and just, it doesn't mean to condone. It doesn't mean passive resignation. It's actually, this is a, a, an active choice. It's a posture. It's like your arms are wide open. You know, when this stuff shows up, instead of like, oh, the dodgeball is coming at my head, it's to open up to it and to open up to it and to let go so that your mind and your hands and your feet are free to do what you really care about doing. And are there some similarities to mindfulness and, and sort of mindfulness meditation approaches? Can you talk about sort of the, yeah. the link there? Sure. Um, ACT is part of the mindfulness tradition, so it does include mindfulness practices. Um, but the purpose of mindfulness is to, is to help us come back to the present moment and also to develop perspective. So when we can be more mindful, which is essential, you know, you don't have to practice um, Buddhism, you don't have to ascribe to a certain religion, even like you know, many spiritual traditions had this mindful component to it. You know, even in Christianity and contemplative practices and so on. So mindfulness really means paying attention on purpose in the present moment right where you are and without getting caught up in the mind's judgment because your mind is going to rush in and judge and evaluate. It can do it for just about anything. You can't have this. You're, you're a failure. That's, you're not good enough. Why bother? Nothing's going to work out. This is bad, that's good. So it's going to do all that stuff. So it's to notice that activity. So it's almost like <clears throat> if your thoughts were your hands and they're pressed up to your face, mindfulness is really getting a perspective. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So moving the hands away so that you can see thoughts as thoughts. Right. Right. And so in ACT, we use mindfulness to develop perspective taking because you cannot change what you don't know. And what you don't know, you'll often fear, right? So with mindfulness, we're getting a perspective. Let's just to see, there's my mind doing its thing. There's my body doing its thing. I can notice that from that vessel perspective, the vessel that was there before the stuff. I can watch the stuff in the vessel, which if you can watch it, you can't be it, right? So when the yeah. thoughts are painful, you know, like you're a loser, you can't be the loser if you can watch the thought, your mind telling you, I am a loser. So you can watch that, and from that perspective then you can choose, is this thought helpful or is it not helpful? So the other piece of mindfulness is it helps us to be right where we are because the mind evolved to take us out of the present, you know, to talk about yesterday and talk about tomorrow, right? And so that's where we often many of us dwell. You know, there's been interesting research uh, by a Harvard team. Um, they basically concluded that, you know, a, a, wan a human mind is a wandering mind <laughs> and a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. And what they're really showing is that our sense of happiness, and I don't mean the feeling, I mean genuine contentment, has more to do with where our mind is. So when our mind is in the future and the past, and they show that it's there most of the time, right, we tend to be unhappy. We're not, when we train our mind to come back to the present, right where we are anyways, even if we're doing mundane tasks like washing the dishes or taking out the garbage, we're happier. We're more content. So mindfulness will bring us back to the present. And the other advantage of that, it will help you show up to the sweetness of life. So when you do things that you really care about, you're there fully able to reap the rewards of it, to really sink into the sweetness, like even if it was difficult to do. And I think that's really important. So I carry the, the difficulty, my mind judging and evaluating. And I went out and I did something that mattered to me. So you've got this sort of bitter sweetness. 
right? instead of just the bitterness of don't go, don't do that, stay with your pain, yeah. and withdraw from life. So. No, so, are there ch- are, are there challenges for this? Like it, it, it's completely fascinating, and yeah. it's so true. When you're talking, it's it's like yes, I agree. This is this yeah. is how it should be. But are there challenges for individuals who might be interested in this? Or what are? It seems like a hard thing sometimes to take your mind and you know look at it from a different po- you know way and and think. How, what are some challenges that individuals face as they're going through this type of therapy? Yeah. Well, I think uh, one of them is. Uh, we often see earlier it is for people to really let go, to let go of the change agenda, the I need to feel good to live well, right? That's sort of, if I feel better, then I'll live better, right? And so that whole struggle itself, see, it, you might... Um, a metaphor might help here. Like, you know, suppose you're down in a hole, you're whatever painful hole you're in, and you're blindfolded. You just happen to fall into this hole, you know, uh, among other holes, and you you fall in. You find yourself in the anxiety hole, and you feel around, and you find you know trying to get out, and you feel around, you find a shovel. So you're like, well, maybe I can dig my way out. So you start to dig, and there are many ways to dig. You know, there all kinds of strategies. Distraction, I'll just not go out. I won't go to the mall. I won't make friends. I won't travel on a plane. I won't, um, you know, I'll, I'll drink more alcohol. I'll get more medication. I'll buy the right. self-help book. So we're digging, digging. And we know that digging makes holes bigger, not smaller. So here you are, your hole's getting bigger and bigger. So I come along. And I'm like, hey, I can help you get out of that hole. And you've got the shovel gripped in your hands. And I've, I'm trying to give you a ladder. What do you need to do to, in order to use the ladder? Let go of the shovel and stop digging. You kind of let go of the shovel and stop digging. That's the first step. Because anything else I give you, I can give you mindfulness. I can give you other wonderful techniques and skills to try. But if you're going to use them like a shovel to right. dig, yeah. and it hasn't worked, it's made your hole bigger, not smaller, right? We don't want to go there. So the hardest thing for people to do, and the c- most courageous thing, which you know people get courage mixed up, and when they think about it, it doesn't mean the absence of fear or difficulty. It means the judgment that something else is more important than mm-hmm. the fear and difficulty. And so the courage here, the willingness, is to let go. Of, of the digging because you know in your own heart that it's not working. I mean, if it were working, I'd say, great. You know, whatever you do to dig out of your pain, if it's really working and giving you the kind of life you want to have, I'd say, super, do it. But for many people, what they find is it's not. Mm-hmm. The digging actually creates more problems than it solves. So the first thing is to let go of that struggle. And I think that's the harder part, because once you let go, it opens up possibilities. And actually, letting go is itself change. So we are here on the Social Workers Radio Talk Show, if you've just tuned in. We're talking to Dr. John Forsyth about um, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT or ACT as some folks call it. And uh, part of what I've heard from your conversation so far, uh, John, is is some use of metaphor. And you just mentioned a metaphor of being in a hole. Is that part of the, the therapy itself, is actually using metaphor with the people you're helping and using that kind of notion of metaphor to help them think differently? Yes, we do use... um, Yeah, ACT has a number of metaphors, and we use them uh, not as just a clever technique, but we use them strategically as a way to help people have a different perspective, a different experience uh, with their pain and difficulty in their life. So it's really... uh, It is a a device or, or a way of speaking in the room, Mm -hmm. but it actually helps people connect with the reality of their experience in a unique, different way, and that gives them, again, fostering sort of a shift in perspective, because again, human beings, we see the world through our thoughts, through our mind, and so without perspective, there's no way to change. You know, you you need the perspective to kind of step back and be able to notice, Mm -hmm. this is what's going on as it is. This is my life and what I want and what I really care about. You know, and where I want to head, and so you, to cultivating that perspective. And the metaphors can be really powerful and li- life-altering for right. many people. I've seen. 
Now you're giving a two-day workshop uh, coming up. What can um, first tell us where wh- uh, if people want to register, how oh. how they can go about doing that? Because this is really interesting, and I think some people might want to register for it. Oh, sure. Where can they go to find out more? Yeah, this is a, a two-day practical workshop on ACT. Uh, it's going to be uh, downtown uh, University of Albany. Uh, and I think the best place to go is just go to my website, drjohnforsyth.com. Mm-hmm. And there, there's a link under workshops to the acceptance commitment therapy training, March 18th and 19th, so next month. So it's a full two days. So we, we're really asking people to come for both days because you'll miss something if you, if you only come for part of, of one of the days. And we're also offering CEUs for mental health professionals, psychologists and social workers, obviously. Great. Yeah. And, and what can participants expect to learn? Like sort of like a little highlight, just what you're talking about, or is there certain strategies or tools that people, you know, either practitioners or individuals who might just be interested in this, what can they be expected to yeah. sort of a highlight of what they should leave from this, leave with when they... Yeah, well, we're going to, this is not going to be a heavy research workshop at all. So um, uh, instead, it's going to be more intensely practical. So. We're going to cover the model. Like we've talked about some of the model, we sort of danced around the ideas, um, but it's it's really important to get the model because everything else flows from that. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a model that goes against the grain of a lot of what we've been taught about mental health and, and psychological suffering and disorders and diagnoses. That this gets a, it's a much more process oriented model where you have to detect these processes of being. Um, you know, buying into your thoughts and being avoidant and struggling and losing contact with the present and being caught up in the stories and lacking values clarity and where you want your life to go. So that's just an example of sort of the suffering components. And so we're going to go into that model and then we're going to step back through it and walk through in act as not a linear therapy. So you, it's more like a dance around processes. So, but we're going to go through the different components of ACT and, and give uh, participants an opportunity to practice the skills, to get to learn new exercises, and bring in tools and strategies that we hope that they can bring right into their, their practice. And I would also just say into their life, too. Because, I mean, I can say personally that doing this work is not just for them. This has also helped me greatly as a human being, as a husband, as a father, um, to to navigate the difficulties, the things of my own vessel, because they'll show up too, yeah. and to really know like what matters to me, and to spend more of my time as best as I can doing those things. So, this is not it's an invitation for people to to learn something, and they will, you know. Well, that's it's going to be intensely practical, uh, but also maybe to take something home that they can bring around the dinner table or with their kids or their spouse or their friends and help them have the life they want to live too. Great, yeah. great. So can you tell us just briefly, we've got a few minutes left, yeah. if you could tell us a little bit about your research and sort of where the research on ACT is headed? Yeah, sure. Right now, uh, I'll just say broadly, there have been um, over, I'd say, 100 clinical trials and at least as many basic science trials looking at the different processes in ACT, so experimental studies as yeah. well. Um, and it's been applied broadly to many different forms of human suffering. So, you know, from addictions to, to you know, uh, anxiety, depression, and so on. Um, and our own research is focused on anxiety and so uh, and, and components of that and, and how people can live their values more fully in their life. So uh, we just actually finished a large study, an international study with 500 people with our uh, workbook, uh, the Mindfulness and Acceptance Workbook for Anxiety, and we tested it in a pure self-help context. So no therapist guidance, coaching, okay. calls. So 500 people from all around the world participated with severe anxiety and, depre- and depression. And one of the things in ACT is we don't offer up anxiety reduction or depression as a goal at all. Instead, what we did was we focused on cultivating skills of acceptance and being more diffused um, and an observer of your thoughts and less attached to your stories and more present and more values connected in taking action with your values. So cultivating compassion, kindness, mindfulness, diffusion, acceptance. And when you focus on teaching those skills, 
People started to live better, the quality of life improved, their anxiety and their depression came down significantly, but not directly by going after it. Right. It came down as a product of cultivating these other skills, which we just thought, you know, it's perfectly consistent with ACT. And what it also does for, for mental health professionals, social work, in any area of mental health, is it redirects your attention to cultivating the conditions for flexibility and kindness, letting go of the struggle, to help the person to open up to their experience without having to change it, change the relationships. You focus your energy on that, yeah. cultivating a kinder, more compassionate relationship with yourself and the things you carry. And you help your the people that seek you out who are suffering to connect with and to start doing things that they really want to be about in this life while they can, which is uplifting and wonderful to see too. You know, people living their lives. So it's not like going from one telephone pole to the next to get your anxiety down. It's about, I want to see my kids play because I love my kids because I want to be a good dad, right? I want to take that trip and not gut it out in the plane. I'm taking the trip because I want to see the world because I love exploring, I love adventure, I love learning. So how about we connect you to those things and help you have more of that in your life and find a way to carry this other stuff that stood between you and that for so long. So there's a whole different shift of, of approach to you know, in this work inside the room and in our lives. And, and so I think, yeah, the ACT research, you know, our study is, you know, it's now, in, it looks like it's going to be impressed. We just got the final rounds of re- right. round of review, so it's going to be coming out. Um, but we describe it in the second edition of the workbook, too. There's a little prologue where we talk about the results of that study. But the evidence is really strong, and, and the psychological flexibility that we're talking about is inside the ACT model. The learning to be flexible and open and diffused and values-focused is linked up with so many good positive outcomes, you know, broadly. And it's probably because the processes that are inside suffering are connected to so many problems that you see in mental health and outside in society too. So we've been talking here with Dr. John Forsyth, who is a professor of clinical psychology here at the University of Albany, and also one of the original developers and uh, movers and shakers behind (laughs) acceptance and commitment therapy. You've been listening to the Social Workers Radio Talk Show here on WCDB Albany. Um, John, maybe one more time, if you could tell folks where they can find your website, uh, some of the self-help books, you know, and anything that you think might, if someone's listening and really intrigued by these ideas, how they might find out more. Oh, sure. Uh, well, our books uh, are available on Amazon, um, so that's probably the best place for people to find them. You could also find them at Barnes & Noble. Uh, and then if they're interested in more information about trainings that I do or talks, including the workshop coming up in March, is just to go to drjohnforsyth.com. Great. Thank you so much for yeah. being our guest. We hope you'll come back. All right. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much.